So here we go back into Mark. This is actually our last sermon in Mark for the rest of the year. And we're going to pick it back up in January. And that will take us all the way to Easter, all the way to the resurrection. And so in the first quarter of next year, we're going to finish Mark. Um, And what's really neat about what Jesus uh, does here is that uh, we're going to read a few verses and, and unpack a few more. But what he does here is he actually contrasts children. He takes children and makes them the object lesson of what it looks like to enter the kingdom of God. And it's, it's very interesting on family worship Sunday like this where kids will be like, oh, there might be a little bit of a distraction or, you know, it might, might make some noise or whatever. It's like, well, they're kids and Jesus didn't find them distracting ever. And often Jesus would actually be calling kids to come to him to, to, to teach them, to, to care for them and, and to preach uh, within crowds with kids in them. Um, so that he would make an object lesson and say, you have to be dependable and humble and needy like these kids in order to even understand what I'm saying and doing. And so watch in, in Mark 10, he starts with this example in verse 13. If I can find it somewhere in my Bible, right here. And he says this, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, lay hands on them, and the disciples rebuked them. They're like, stop doing that. It's Jesus. He's way too important. But when Jesus saw that his disciples were doing this, he was indignant. That's Jesus for really mad. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Don't hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. It's to the children that belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not approach the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And then he took them in his arms and he blessed them and he laid hands on them. And that right there, the laying on of hands is is very significant because it's a way of like specially marking people. It's anointing. It's laying hands on somebody to, to designate people for a special purpose. And that's exactly what he's doing here. Why this is important is because what Jesus just did there is he held up kids as an example. And now the text that we're going to look at now, he now gives us another example of a very successful, really good looking, type A achiever young man who is the opposite of a dependent child. And so he sets these kids up as this is what it looks like to enter the kingdom of God. And then he's like, and these types of people are going to struggle. So he elevates kids as the prime example of a posture and then shows us the flip side of that. Watch in verse 17 through 31. We'll read the whole thing. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man came running up and knelt down before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he just heard everything that was said about the kids, and he's like, What about me? Like, I, I want to know how I get this thing. Like, how do I get into the kingdom? And Jesus said, Well, why do you call me good? That's a normal greeting in the ancient world of like, hey, if you call someone good, you're like really elevating them. But Jesus makes the point here. He said, no, 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 but, but only God is good, which is his cheeky way of saying, so if you're calling me good and only God is truly good, then you got to know that I'm God. He says, you, well, you know the commandments. Just do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Stop lying. Don't defraud. Honor your father, father and your mother. And he said, well, teacher, I've kept all of these from my youth. This is a good guy. And Jesus, looking at him passionately in the Greek, it's amazing that in all the crowds, he makes eye contact with him. And he loves him. That's the key. Out of compassion and love, he said to him, but you lack one thing. So he doesn't even say like, no, you haven't. Don't be silly. You haven't nailed those. He's like, maybe you have. You're a good guy. But you've, you've forgotten one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. Watch his response. Disheartened by that saying, crushed, he went away sorrowful, grieving, for he had great possessions. He had a ton of stuff, really nice things. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter into the kingdom. And the disciples were shocked by these words. And Jesus said to them again, children, calls them children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom. And they were exceedingly astonished by this and said to him, well, then who can be saved? Because you're just like a camel, the tiny little pinhole of a needle. You're like, okay, Jesus is being silly and facetious, showing us that that's impossible. So they're like, how is this even possible? Who can enter? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. 
And Peter began to say to him, see, we've left everything. Classic Peter, I love it. Puts his foot in his mouth again. He's like, yeah, that's us. We nailed it. We did all that. Remember Jesus? We left everything and followed you. Look at us. And Jesus said, no, no, truly I say to you, there is no one, understand, who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Let me pray for us as we jump in. Father, I'm so thankful for your word that you're a God that doesn't stand far off. That you are a generous God. That you lavish us with grace. And it's out of that that we can experience your nature and character and also live generous lives with all that you've entrusted to us. I pray that you would work that into our heart today. That it would make much of you and change lives across our city. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So what is happening here? Well, we meet a young rich man. Uh, killing it. He probably gives TED Talks, right? He's probably like in top of his career, lives in the nicest uh, neighborhood. He's driven, he's educated, he's, he's wealthy, he's type A. He knows what he wants and he knows how to go and get it, but he's missing something. He has all of that, but he's missing something and he knows it. He's been listening to Jesus' teachings going, I got a good life. I'm a good guy. I, I enjoy life. I mean, this is a good life. I'm living the good life. But, but I just feel like there's something nagging me. There's something that is causing desperation in him. So he comes to this point where he asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I love this question because everyone asks a version of this question. Religious or not, whether we consider ourselves spiritual or not, everyone lives with this question underlying everything we do, which is, what is happiness? Where can I find life? What does fulfillment and satisfaction actually feel like and look like? And anything that works against that, we try to just kind of tweak it, tweak our definition of happiness and contentment, and then go and get it. How can we experience full life, life to the fullest? But notice he asks the right question, but in the wrong way. The right question, but in the wrong way. Notice what he says. He says, what do I have to do? to inherit eternal life. He still thinks that it's about what he can achieve. He still thinks it's about what he can do, maybe to get attention, the attention of his peers or to be a better influencer or to make more money, to invest better. He still thinks that life is found in what he does or what he avoids doing. But the story of the Bible and what Jesus is under, kind of pinning under all of this that the story of the Bible is that life isn't found in what we do or avoid doing, but it's in surrendering all of life to the God who made us. And that nagging question is sitting under the surface for this young, rich ruler. And notice the key word, inherit eternal life. Has anybody received an inheritance before? What do you do to receive an inheritance? Nothing. Diddly squat. You do not get an inheritance from behavior unless they cut you out of the family and it's because of your behavior. But besides the point, pray about it, all right? You don't get an inheritance because of your behavior. You get an inheritance because of blood. And that's exactly the point here. He's like, how do I inherit all of what you're saying, Jesus? Because he's attracted to Jesus. He's like, hey, your teachings are good. I want to know who you are. Maybe I even want to consider following you. But what do I have to do to get it? And Jesus is like, no, no, you're asking the right question the wrong way. This is an inheritance. Inheritance is given based on who you belong to, not based on how you behave, what you do and what you do not do. You don't get an inheritance. You don't take an inheritance. You receive an inheritance. And right here, reach, this is the good news of the gospel. This is nothing short of the gospel just packed in one sentence right there. That the gospel is right there. That we receive what we receive not based on how well we've lived or how poorly we've lived. We don't get cut out of the family at all. But that Jesus, the son over the whole family would come and actually die in our place regardless of where we're at and adopt us into the family as sons and daughters, as brothers and sisters. And that's exactly why Jesus finishes the way that he does. He's like, oh, you think that you, you have a sacrifice for walking away from different things or tension in your family at Thanksgiving? No, no, no. You're gonna get way more brothers and sisters as you come into the kingdom of God. 
You're coming into the family because your life is changing. It doesn't belong to you anymore. Your life now belongs to the God that is over all things. So we have to remember that the gospel is something radically different than religion, but also radically different than non-religion. Religion says, what can I do to earn God's attention or grace or forgiveness or blessing? What do I have to do to get from God? That's what religion does. But non-religion still does the same thing. It says, what can I do to find life? What can I do to be happy? What can I do apart from God, because I'm not into the religious thing, to be happy and find life? And the gospel comes, and it's something else entirely different than both of those options, amen? That the gospel shows up, and it's, it's that God sees you already. It's that God loves you, accepts you, pursues you at your worst, so that he can give you his best. That's the gospel. Not pinned on what you're doing or not doing at all. And that's so freeing when we goof up, Amen? Like it's so freeing that you, we don't have to stay in guilt or shame or condemnation when, not if, when we fail. When we get locked into just bad habits and behaviors and all sorts of nonsense that we can actually step out of that and say, hey, no more guilt, shame, condemnation because it's not even based on my merit and value before the Father is not based on how well I've been doing or how poorly I've been doing. It immediately lifts the weight and the burden of religion and non-religion from our shoulders because it was already put on Jesus' shoulders. Romans 5.8 is my favorite example of this, that God demonstrates, he shows his love for us like this. How? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and gave his life for us. The gospel is experienced not when we figure out what we can do and, can, and, and need to stop doing, but the gospel is experienced with open hands. Nothing to offer coming as poor beggars to the one who has everything that we need. Do you remember how Jesus' Beatitudes start in the Sermon on the Mount? The blessed are those, the blessed are those. Remember how it starts? Blessed are the rich in spirit. No, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom. Poor, meaning I got nothing to bring, nothing in my hands, empty pockets. Simply to the cross I cling, right? This kind of poverty of spirit complete and utter dependence upon God. And that's why this young man is missing it. Because he still thinks that all that he has belongs to him. He still thinks that he went, he worked hard, he's a self-made young man, he's killing it in all the ways that you could be killing it at his age. Maybe he's in like the top 30, under 30 in Forbes, Dusty Foot magazine, whatever edition that he'd be in, right? But the contrast between children of utter dependence, utter dependence, like our children would not have gotten dressed this morning. They wouldn't have eaten food. They probably wouldn't have woken up on time if we did not wake them up. They're utterly dependent upon us. And this young man is independent. He's a self-made man. And Jesus is making this contrast saying the way into the kingdom is humility. The way into the kingdom is acknowledging that nothing that I have belongs to me or comes from me. The way into the kingdom is utter dependence and trust in God and who he is and what he does. It's a beautiful display of the gospel here. And what's really cool is that this guy's not even a bad guy, right? Because it's not even like Jesus is like, you terrible, terrible guy. He's actually a really good guy. Like, like there's such thing as good people, image bearers who are doing pretty good things who do not yet know their creator, right? So, so there are things. So we, don't, we gotta be careful not to like take... Our, our doctrine of sin and be like, if you don't know Jesus, you are utterly disgraceful and disgusting all the time everywhere. It's like, no, you're created in the image of God and there's something in you that wants to create and be fruitful and multiply. You might not know where it comes from or who gave it to you. And that's this man. That's this young man. He's doing good things. He's a good guy. He's a successful guy. That's good. You can celebrate that. Jesus doesn't um, criticize him for that. Oh, you good man who's successful. You know, like, he's like, you are. You are a good guy. You've done that. Good for you. That's awesome. But you're missing something. You're missing something. And what he shows him is that his success is, is actually something that's keeping him from God. Have you ever thought about that? That some, some of the ways that our culture screams success and health and wealth and blessed could actually be distractions from truly living in utter dependence upon God. 
Because we only see distractions as suffering and hardship and disease and sickness because we're hashtag blessed and if God's blessing me and everything's good, then God must love me. That's how we typically frame it. And this man is framing it exactly like that as well. But here's what, he, what Jesus does for him. Because he loves him and because he's full of compassion for him and he's patient with him, he shows him that he's still finding his own goodness and value in what he does. So Jesus points out what he's failing to do. This is the difference between commission and omission. He's doing a lot of good things, but he's missing something. There's something that Jesus points out here, and it's subtle. But you got to understand that with omission, not doing the right thing is the wrong thing. Amen? Like omission, not doing something God's called us to, choosing to not be obedient in ways that you know you should be obedient is the same thing as doing something wrong. And this man is trying to put a smoke screen out of like, but look at all the things I'm doing. And Jesus is like, yeah, but what about all the stuff that you're neglecting? What about all the things you're not doing? It's a good question to put to ourselves and ask ourselves: are we putting off things that God has called us to? Are we de- delaying or even denying obedience where God has already called us? What areas of our life may we be actually sinning by omission, not commission? And again, we love behavior, so we constantly point to, well, look at the 11 good things I did this week, right? Look, look, that looks nice, doesn't it? And Jesus says, yeah, but what about all of the things that you failed to do? And he doesn't do this to crush this young man. He does do it, though, to humble him and invite him into a deeper form of surrender and trust and dependence. And if you notice, he's filled with compassion. In the Greek, it's a strong word. Jesus, for some reason, whatever it is, is the only time in Mark it actually happens, that Jesus, for some reason, stops in his tracks, and this young man's question rocks him. And he turns and he makes eye contact with him in the crowd and he's full of love for him. So, so don't hear this as Jesus like rebuking and yelling and, and angry. Notice he's indignant. He's actually indignant not with him but with his own disciples. That's crazy. He's not indignant with the, see- the, the seeker, the spiritual one who's searching. He's not indignant with him at all. He's not angry. He's actually full of love for the young man. But then he points out that his lifestyle, not only does it not keep all the commandments, it actually fails at the first commandment. It's really subtle here, but it's gorgeous. Just like, it's just Jesus, right? He's like, well, I kept all the commandments. And he like quotes all of them. And Jesus is like, good, but you forgot the first one. And that is have no other gods before me. And I know you have another one in there. That's wild. So while he was trying to posture himself and put on like this really nice airbrushed Instagram-esque picture of himself, Jesus is like, no, 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 you're missing the entire foundation of everything that you do. There's something else there that's still more important than God. That's why you are so grieved when you're called to put stuff down to follow me. His blind spot is that he's still looking for security and comfort and happiness in his wealth, in his accomplishments, in his possessions, in his standard of life and lifestyle. He's not a bad guy living for bad things, but he's still finding his identity in things that will keep him from dependence upon God. So what does he do? Jesus invites him to lay all that down and follow him, and he's crushed. He likes his stuff too much. This is a really important point, because if there are things in your life that you struggle to surrender to God, or sacrifices that you still really fight to make, they're likely too important. And it's not just like, oh, maybe it's a little bit too important, but the Bible actually calls earthly things that become ultimate things, idols. That they're things that promise to offer you what God only can, and ultimately they overpromise and underdeliver. And if you have a human heart beating in your chest right now, guess what else is there? Idols. Fighting for your primary affection. Fighting for dependence. Fighting to distract you from following God with everything, reckless abandonment of everything that you have because it ultimately came from him in the first place. Idols show up and say, no, but what about, not this though. Like not, not this part. Like you'll do a better job in this domain, like managing this section. Give God like all of that stuff, but just take that one thing, just kind of like tuck it back there. Don't let him have that part. That's an idol. And sometimes this text has been used to like mandate poverty. Right, because he tells the young man to go and sell everything. So you're like, oh, wow, I guess, okay. (laughs) I don't know, is that what I do? Like, right, I guess I'll sell everything, right? 
But notice, there's several other times in Scripture where Jesus is talking with very wealthy people, and he doesn't tell them that. He actually encourages them to steward all that they have. Sometimes it's actually poor stewardship to go and sell everything that you have if God has entrusted you with lots of beautiful things, hospitality, um, uh, wealth, success, business acumen, all that stuff. Those are good things. And Jesus isn't telling us to abandon those things. He's specifically, though, calling this young man to sell everything because he knows it's so important to him. There's lots of wealthy people in scripture all over the place. So wealth in and of itself is not bad. And that's, that's the weird verse that gets taken out of context all the time. It's like, money is the root of all evil. And you're like, no, go read that bad boy one more time. The love of money is the root of all kinds of nastiness. Right? It's very different. Money's not bad. Wealth isn't bad. Beautiful things aren't bad. Good things are not bad. Your ability to actually do well as an entrepreneur is not bad. Those are great things, good things. But when they become ultimate things, they become a bad thing. And that's what he's getting at here. Joseph of Arimathea, loaded. Buried our Lord. Zacchaeus, loaded. Killing it. Right? All the women named in scripture that supported Jesus' ministry. Loaded. Like really rich women that are just like writing checks for Jesus and as they follow him around. Go, you'll find their names, they're everywhere. So it's not about wealth, it's about how ultimate and important wealth has become for this young man. So the question for all of us out of this is, what do you struggle right now, this week? Like not the hypothetically or theoretically of like, I'll think about that later. But like right now, this week, what, what have you struggled to give up to follow Jesus? What grieves you? Like what, what do you think about the trusting God with? And you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I'm there yet. That's what's happening to this young man. Jesus calls every would-be follower to surrender every area of our lives, not just components of it. And that's the point here. And if you notice, it's actually the wealth and success that this young man is experiencing that keeps him from trusting and following Jesus. It prevents him from the childlike dependence that Jesus just set up as the example. And this is definitely true of us in the West. If there's anything that we are guilty of, we're guilty of a lot of things. But if there's one thing that we are definitely guilty of, maybe more than anything else, is our, that our materialism and North American kind of Western prosperity keeps us from health, helpless and healthy dependence upon God. More than anything else, more than any other area of our life. Wealth tells us that we have what we need most. That's the problem. Ultimately, though, it's a lie, right? It's an illusion. Wealth can't give us what we need most. It can give us good things, but ultimately we'll end up like this young man with that nag underneath the surface of there's something else. I'm still missing it. I'm still missing something. In the first century context, there was a popular view floating around that in, in the worshiping community that wealth, financial blessing, meant God's favor. That if you were rich, and that was only about 1% to 2% of the ancient world, by the way, who actually was not in abject poverty. So you're talking about like the one percenters, right? They're like, God loves us. And for the 99%, uh, I don't know. Maybe you guys should do something different. Maybe you should pull up your bootstraps and work harder. Right? And there was this thing floating around that's under the surface of this text. Does it sound familiar? Because the prosperity gospel, which is not a gospel at all, because it's not good news, it's terrible news, equates the American dream or the Canadian dream and financial prosperity with God's approval. That we just name it, we claim it. If God does it, he loves us. The problem with this, and there's many, I'll only name one because the kids are here. And I can't preach for an hour and nine minutes again like last week because you'll be mad. But the problem with this is that if wealth is a sign of God's blessing, what is poverty? Punishment? A curse? A neglect? A lack of love? Family, 2.5 billion people on planet Earth live on less than $2 a day in abject poverty. Are they cursed? Are they forgotten? Are they not loved? Are they overlooked? Here's another one. Most followers of Jesus today on planet Earth are poor. And not just underneath the poverty line, but live in abject poverty. Most of the people that are entering the kingdom of God are poor. 
I know in our Western thing, we think that Christianity looks like white, wealthy North Americans who vote conservative. But that's a, a thing that we created. We made that up. And it's an idol. It's a golden calf that we give ourselves to over and over again. While the rest of the world, in abject poverty, is walking in vibrant, dependent, loving, gospel-empowered lives to King Jesus. We need a radical deconstruction and reframing of our understanding of wealth and all that God has given us. Because we have so much. We have so much. And this kind of thinking, this prosperity thinking, which is a false teaching from the deepest, darkest pits of not heaven. Time Magazine did a thing on evangelicals, which is always scary when they do that, right? Because you're like, oh, do, should I call myself an evangelical while, they, while I read this article? Or <laughs> 61% of professing evangelicals in North America believe that God wants them to be prosperous. That's a lot of people. 31% believe that if you give money to God, he's going to give you more. He's just like this candy machine, right? He's just like, I'll just put in a quarter and 30 tootsie, tootsie rolls come out, right? He's just the means to the end of what I really want, which is a nice life and a nice ha- green grass, a nice house, and kids that smile, at least in public or whatever. It's like God is just the means to the end of my true God, which is all of that, a lifestyle that I've decided I want to give myself to. Four out of 10 evangelical churches fall in line with the prosperity theology. 40% would have some kind of underlying belief that God wants you to be rich and doesn't just want you to be rich, but actually if you come and pray like this and speak in tongues like that or worship like this and dance like this and give like that, that God's gonna give you more. This is not the gospel. This is not what Jesus just started with, with an utter dependent open hands, empty pockets approach to come and actually worship King Jesus and enter the kingdom. It's not. It's a false gospel. And so we have to be very careful here, okay? This is where I'm gonna pastor you. We can miss the point of this text. We can miss the point of Jesus' teaching here because we don't consider ourselves as rich. Right away you can check out and be like, no, I'm like the kid. I'm like the the dependent kid because I know Jesus, yeah, right? No, 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 no. No, no, you're the rich, and I'm the rich. And the only reason why we don't believe that we are rich and materialistic and self-indulgent is because we live here. Okay, don't miss that. That's the only reason you don't think you're rich, is because you live here, right? And again, as soon as COVID, like, dies, just, like, travel, get out of here, go. Like, get out of North America and go and actually spend time and see how the rest of the world lives. You will come home grieving your wealth, looking at how you can be more generous because you will actually see how the world lives. We don't think we're wealthy. We don't think we're the young man here because we live here. And you know why this is so crazy and so intoxicating? It's because there's always somebody with something more than you and I, right? Like, so I got like my Kia Forte and I drive by a Tesla and I'm like, oh, my Forte kind of sucks. It's like, but only 4% of people on planet Earth have a car. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm rich again. I love my, I'm like hugging my Forte in the morning. Oh, Forte, you're so lovely. Even with the crack on the bumper, you're beautiful as you are, right? Like, do you see what happens though? The coveting and the comparison game is never ending. It's actually how we build our identity in the West. Just by who we're not like. I'm not blue collar, I'm definitely baby blue or closer to white collar. I don't live in that neighborhood, you know that one, right? I live in this one, look at me, right? So we build an identity on what other people do not have. Or what they do have that we don't have because they always have a nicer car or a touch screen in their fridge. What? Or a coach bag or more savings or more crypto or a bigger house or fresher sneaks or whatever it is. Like you just keep going, right? You just keep going. And it never stops. We are the wealthiest civilization of history. We are, you and me. I know we don't feel like it when we drive through down Lakeshore and see all the Teslas. But we are. If you make more than $34,000 a year annually, you're in 1% of the world's earnings. 
crazy. If you have a house to go home to, food in that fridge, in that house, and some money in the bank, it doesn't have to be a lot, just some, you're richer than 75% of the globe. So hear me, you don't see yourself as rich, materialistic, self-indulgent, and greedy. You don't. And that maybe is our problem. That we don't see that in ourself. Greed is so insidious and hard to see in ourself. I remember reading a story of Tim Keller, and there he's reflecting on like 40 years of ministry, and he said, never once in my life as a pastor have I had somebody approach me and say, Pastor, I think I'm greedy, and I'd love if you prayed with me about my greed. And you know what's crazy? It's one of the most repeated sins mentioned in, in Scripture. Greed. Being greedy. But it's so insidious and hard to see in ourselves. So understand that although you don't see yourself as wealthy, the rest of the world looks at us and sees wealth. The rest of the world looks at us and sees excess. The rest of the world looks at us and sees obesity and muchness and bigness and manyness and self-indulgence because we are. So Jesus uses an absurd and funny image so we don't miss the point. With the camel and the eye of a needle. It's like, it's really hard for an elephant to get in a Mini Cooper. You're like, yes, very hard. Almost impossible, you'd say. Yes, very impossible. That's like you and I getting into the kingdom of God. And you're like, huh? Right? That's, that's what he's doing here. Camel through the eye of a needle. You know the part that you can't get the thread in when you need to go sew something? A camel. Okay? With like all of its duffel bags on it. You know, walking in the desert. Okay? That camel going in there. It's impossible. And that example is that Jesus used the biggest land animal in the area contrasted with the smallest opening in the household. Okay, so that's it. So it would have been even, like it would have been fine if you just said, it's like a camel getting in the front door. That would already be really hard. But you could be like, no, I feel like I could get the camel in there, right? <laughs> Some of us contrarians would be like, ah, depends how hard we push. I think we could get him in there. Jesus wanted to make sure that we didn't miss the point that this is impossible. But that, it's not impossible with God. And that's the good news. The hyperbole, hyperbole that he uses here is to show us how utterly crazy it is that God would actually save any of us. Rich, poor, anything in between. Good people, bad people, all people. And that it's this upside down paradoxical kingdom that he's calling us into. And that's why he finishes and says the first will be last and the last will be first. He's like, baby, if you think you're killing it now and you're first in line and look how successful you are, it's the overlooked and the ignored and the marginalized and the poor and the voiceless who are going to be first in line in the kingdom of God. That's the kind of God we serve. And the disciples are blown away. The Greek language is really strong here for how shocked they are. It's actually besides them, beside themselves, right? It's that expression. Like they're out, like having like an outer body experience when Jesus says that. Because why? Well, they believe that if you're blessed, hashtag blessed, that God loves you. And he just literally told them, the thing that you want most is actually the thing that's keeping you from me. Crazy. We think that wealth is a blessing from God. And Jesus says it can be a barrier to God. That, that is shocking. That's very absurd to say. And this is why Jesus talks so much about possessions and wealth and money. It's one of the most repeated topics in the Bible. It actually is about 25% of everything Jesus ever says come back, comes back to money and materialism and wealth and greed. What we do with what we have shows us what's most important to us. That's why Jesus addresses it so often. How we use what we've been given literally makes up our life, right? And that's why Jesus comes back to it over and over again. Jesus just repeatedly comes back and goes, hey, money talks. Money talks about you. Money talks about your priorities. Money talks about what's most important to you. Money points to where your treasure is, your ultimate treasure. And then he flips being blessed on its head constantly. Because he says, no, 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 the truly blessed aren't the rich and famous. They're not the attractive. They're not the ones without wrinkles in their face or the charismatic or the fit. But they're the nobodies, the unnoticed, the overlooked, the humble, the uncelebrated. That's the upside down kingdom of what it looks like to actually be blessed. Now, can you have wealth and be rich and also have that posture? Of course. Amen. I know men and women who have more money than, they would make, it would make your head spin. And you would never know that they have that much money. Do you know why? 
because they, they don't care about it too much. And so all they're doing is looking at giving it away. I know people who reverse tithe. Get that in your head for a second. They give away 90% of what they earn and only keep 10 because that's how much they make because they can live on 10. But you wouldn't know. They're not rolling around in their, in their Teslas, pulling up to their 17 car garages and posting it on Instagram because that's not the kingdom they're a part of. That's not, that's not what they're living for. In fact, they're living to give it away because they see themselves as trying to be managers and stewards of what God has blessed them with. So they're trying to do their best with the time that they have to give away as much as humanly possible. And I know that's not most of us in the room, and that's okay. But we still have to pay attention to what Jesus says about this because it is something that is at the core of our life, whether we, have, we, whether we think we have a little bit or whether we have a lot. Jesus warns us in the Sermon on the Mount over in Matthew 6. We'll look at it real quick and then we'll apply a couple things and be done. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't do it. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure. So he does want us to use treasure and lay, up, lay, lay it up, right? He does want us to store stuff. But store it. Where are we? Yeah, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then the last line, he says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the prosperity theology that floats around in our Western mentality says, yeah, but we're always the exception to the rule, so we can do that, baby. We can serve both God and money. Just look at our lives. Look how blessed we are. Look at all that we have. God must love us. We can serve God and enjoy all this stuff. But notice that Jesus starts with the negative, don't treasure things on earth, and a positive, but treasure what's in heaven. In other words, don't depend on wealth. Invest it where it matters most. Jesus wants us to store up treasure, but he wants us to store up treasure that actually lasts the scope of eternity. Storing up treasure on earth isn't success, he says. It's actually settling. That's settling. That's weak. That's not actually a good way to live. He's saying you, you, you were made for so much more than just a strong RRSP and shiny stuff and renovated bungalows in the burbs with a comfy retirement plan where you get all leathery. He's saying there's more to life than that. Like there's more to be treasured than that. Randy Alcorn in his book, The Treasure Principle, which if you have not read it, get it, read it. Maybe we'll get it in our bookstore, okay? Uh, says this, when Jesus warns us not to store up treasures on earth, it's not because wealth might be lost. It's because wealth will always be lost. Either it leaves us while we live or we leave it when we die. No exceptions. And that is exactly, I think, what Jesus is getting at here. And the young man struggles. Now, we don't know if he ever does go and sell it all and come back to Jesus. But that's the challenge to him. And he finishes and says, in the Sermon on the Mount, no one can serve two masters. So just hear me. Jesus isn't concerned with us having money. He's concerned about money having us. That makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? We can have a ton of money and it not have us, not have a grip on us. We can have a little bit of money and it have a grip on us. Some of us don't have very much, and we're already greedy and self-indulgent and selfish. And then you're like, why can't I get more? And God's like, because you're doing silliness with, every, with like the little I gave you. What? what? Right? So, so we got to understand, like, Jesus isn't concerned about the money itself and the dollar sign on the paper. He is worried, though, about money having us. And the serving two masters thing is actually spiritual language, right? It's impossible to live for God and for money. But how we use our money will show us what God we serve. That's the point Jesus is making here. And more than anything else, money imitates what only God can provide. It makes promises it can't keep. Money promises to you and me to meet all our needs, to give us a full and fulfilling life, to make us happy, to give us security for the now and the future, to make us stable, to give us hope, to give us freedom, and to heal our pain. Money promises you all of that. That's what's wild about it. But it always overpromises and underdelivers. And it doesn't make a good God. Like money can be good, but it makes a terrible God. So how do you know that money is a problem for you? All right? Well, here's a few things. You think about what you have to give instead of what you get to give. If you think about what you have to give, 
money's a problem for you. If you think about what you get to give, I think you're moving towards wise stewardship and a humble posture of, wow, God, I can't believe you've given me all that I've, I, I have. Another way that money could be a problem is that you can't give large amounts of it, only small. So you're just not, you're not radically generous. Or another way that this shows up is the more that you make, the lower percentage of the overall income you give. Or you compare yourselves to others who have more than you and you think you'll be happier if you have more money. How many of us think that if we just had $100,000 more this year that we'd be happier? All of us, right? Like, like come on. Like a 100 grand bonus, right? Last day of December just comes in the mail. You'd be like, yes, I'd be happier. Of course I would, right? But what's crazy about that is that facts and stats show us that that is not true. That the upper class and the 2% of the wealthiest in the globe are far less happy than the middle class and the poor. It's crazy. In the words of the late great philosopher, Notorious B.I.G., Mo money, mo problems. He was right, baby. He was right. Thank you, Biggie. Biggie. Here's, here's the point, though. Jesus invites us. It's an, it's an invitation to us today, right now, through this text. For his disciples to live radically generous lives. Why? Because it's the only appropriate response to his radical generosity towards us. And it's not just money. I mean, it is money, but it's also what money can buy. If you notice the rust and moths and, and, and thief stuff, Jesus is saying if you live for anything that can be stolen away by rust, moths, and thieves, it's not worth your life. So it's not just money, but it's also the lifestyle that we think money can buy us. Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Live radically generous with all of that because of the radical generosity that I have extended to you. That there's a humble posture of, wow, God is radically generous. And I get to respond to his generosity by also going and providing for people's needs and being open with all that I have and open-handed and, and just be radically generous. Allow him to tell me not what I not have to give, but to allow him to tell me what he wants me to do with what he has already given me. And when we start with that posture, we lay all of our cards out on the table and say, God, I can't believe you've been so generous with me. And not just with stuff, but with your grace with your love, with your compassion and your patience every time I'm a bonehead. You're so generous towards me. How could I not go and extend that same generosity to others? Paul makes this point in 2 Corinthians 8 when he says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, can we all agree Jesus was loaded? Yeah, yeah, he was doing all right, okay? Although he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. How paradoxical is that? That God himself gave up everything for us. That God chose poverty over opulence for our sake. Over and over again, the Bible ties love to giving. That, that if we actually love, we give. That's what we do. That's what love looks like. It's like, how do we define love? By giving. Giving of ourselves, giving of all that we have. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He gave his only son. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will give me obedience to, your, to my commandments. That you will keep the commandments. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love together in community as Christ loved us and what? Gave himself up for us. Church, it's experiencing the generosity of God that changes how we see everything because it changes how we see ourselves. That we actually end up seeing ourselves as humble recipients of all that God chooses to give us rather than self-made people who go and get it, go and get ours. We just say nonsense, right? Like, get it, mm, savage. Stop it. And that's radical generosity. That's the radical generosity of God. And how it shows up in our life, well, it's a joyful, cheerful giving of all that he has given us as a way to show what he is like. What a beautiful gift. What a beautiful privilege that we have. We can just take what we have, everything that he's given us, and say, I want to use everything that I have that, are, that is in my care from God to show other people what this God is like. And if we're honest, the 21st century Western church is known for having a ton of money. 
a ton of buildings, a ton of stuff, but very little power and very little influence in our culture. Whereas if you sit with the book of Acts, go and read Acts this week. It takes about two hours total. Turn Netflix off, read Acts. Your soul will thank you. The first century church throughout the book of Acts was known for generosity and power. Generosity and power. And they're tied together. So where can you grow in generosity? Especially as we think about December and we go into the holiday season. Rather than just amass more gadgets that we don't need, that our kids are going to forget about in literally 36 hours. Like less sometimes. Right? What would it look like to go into the, this season reflecting on the radical generosity of God towards us? Not to just buy stuff for each other. And again, gifts are great. They're beautiful. Love gifts. Love receiving them especially. I'm a terrible gift giver. 11 years of marriage. I'm growing. Okay? Pray for me. Gifts are beautiful, beautiful things. But all that God has given us is not just for us to enjoy and for those closest to us, but for those who don't have what we have. So how can we practice this? How can we practice giving as a response to God's generosity? Well, think for a minute, a couple questions, and we'll pray and we're done. But just think for a minute, what has God entrusted to you? Just take inventory, quickly. Just take stock of everything that is under your care right now. Relationships that are in your care. Jobs, careers, talents, gifts that you have. Spaces that you find yourself in, whether it's your home or it's your, your street or your neighborhood or, or your workplace or your campus, wherever you find yourself, that's a space to be stewarded. Money, wealth, stuff, possessions that you have. Time, energy, attention. We've talked about this a lot for the last couple of years, that attention is maybe one of the most valuable things that we have, right? How can we redirect our attention and steward our attention well? How can you intentionally raise your standard of giving rather than your standard of living? So often as our salary goes up, or as like kind of like we make moves over life, we go from like having nothing to having a little bit more to having more. But so often, as our salary and income increases and we move and we buy houses and our investments change and whatever, we actually give less, not more. Statistically, it's just true. We just give less. What would it look like for us to actually have a graduated tithe? Like we give more as we earn more, not less. And last, how can you adjust your lifestyle and your standard of living so that you can give sacrificially and cheerfully? Like your actual budget, not like theoretically. Eh, maybe I'll do that. It's like, no, no, like your budget. Like, look at your budget. Like, your money talks about where your heart is. So look at your budget. If you don't have a budget, that's probably part of the problem. Make a budget, right? But that God actually loves a cheerful giver. Second Corinthians 9, 8. Why does he love a cheerful giver, an intentional giver? Well, because he's an intentional God and he's a cheerful giver. So what would it look like for us to actually adjust our lifestyle, spend less on things so that we can actually give more? What would that look like? And to wrap up, before I pray for us, we're going to go into communion, which is a response to this beautiful generosity of God. That God would empty himself of not just his glory and his divinity and, and lay all that down and come to us as human, but that God himself empties himself of his entire life so that you and I can have life. But just hear this. God's not interested in your money, but he is interested in your heart. He does not need our money. He does not. He's okay. He's doing all right. But he does want our heart. And the good news for each of us is that if God has our heart and we have experienced this radical generosity, the love and grace that he just lavishes us with, he will use every part of us, including everything that he's given us, to go out there and be forces of renewal and change in, in spaces that need it most. Let me pray for us to that end, and we'll celebrate with communion. Father, you didn't need to do what you did for us, but you chose to. And because of your love, you give of yourself to us. And I just pray for us, all of us right here in this room, that we would assume the posture of childlike hearts coming into the kingdom. That we would see ourselves as not independent and go out and getting ours and, and doing us, but that we would see ourselves as completely dependent on you, 
and that even the very breath in our lungs is a gift that enables us to do what we do. I just pray that you would humble us and that into this holiday season especially that we would really re-examine ourselves, that we would look at where greed might be hiding, self-indulgence might be hiding, that love of money might be hiding, and that you would remove that so that we would actually be able to walk in obedience and radical generosity as a reflection of your generosity towards us. I pray that that would be done in and through us and that it would change lives and neighborhoods and cities and ultimately as we continue to give as a church to lots of things across the globe that we would see the, the entire globe changed by us being able to re-examine and reevaluate and live generous lives in response to you. So we thank you for all that you have entrusted to us and we ask that we would just continue to grow in our stewardship of all of that. And we ask these things in the only name that matters. In Jesus' name, amen.